So, <clears throat> at anyway, tonight we're going to be looking at what, um, how, do you, how do you deal with failure and when you feel like a failure. We've been looking at life's issues and problems in life, and that's what we're going to be looking at tonight, about being a failure. And um, I'll tell you, I think this affects all of us in some way, shape, or form throughout our life. We can think of an instance when we have been a failure and uh, how it affected us and how it impacted us. I'm sure that we can. But tonight, before we get into that, of course, we always pray on Wednesday night. We pray every service, but we take requests on Wednesday night to pray to see um, uh, what you would like to mention this evening. So we, we remember Holly, right? Holly is still having quite a struggle, and uh, she's posted something on her email and on Facebook, so uh, keep her in your prayers. Uh, Tamara Johnson, her, her stepfather, was really like her father, uh, passed away, and of course like a grandfather to, uh, to the kids, and, uh, and so remember uh, Tamara and George in your prayers. They had the funeral today in Clay County. She said if she could make it there. I, I don't know about the water levels in some areas, but um, at any rate, uh, p- keep them in your prayers. You know, their daughter and family also moved away to, uh, to Alabama, I think. Yeah, so that's hard on them because they took the grandkids and stuff and moved. And, and then on top of that, her brother-in-law also passed away last night, I believe, yesterday evening. So, Tamara, so they, they've had two losses there real close together. So, remember them. Continue to keep uh, the Bigfords in your prayers. Um, I mean, he's been getting some good reports, and that's great. They're going to be going back down again shortly. So, uh, let's remember them in, in, in our prayers also. Uh, someone else tonight? You want to mention uh, James? Unspoken. Unspoken. Okay. All right, Gene, good to see you back. I wasn't here last Wednesday. I think you were, but, uh, yeah. Yeah. We've been getting a lot of rain, but yeah, yeah, yeah. It's still, it's still forecasting quite a bit of rain, but hopefully it will continue like the little spots we've had of rain. Then it stops for a while. That's real helpful. It's not that steady downpour for a long period of time. So uh, yeah, a lot of people are living in flood-prone areas, we're really watching that close right now in a lot of these counties. Um, there's some places that always flood. But, uh, you know, Richwood was hit really hard about you know, almost five years ago now. Yeah, it's always rough. Wyoming County has always had some places it's rough. So uh, let's do remember, remember that. We need the rain, I know, but the ground's pretty saturated now. So get into risky risky time. Someone else have a request? Yeah. 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 All right, Amy. Someone else? Yes. your sister yeah and that's that's another thing when you said sister uh tamara she's really got a burden for her sister that's lost and uh her stepfather would witness a lot to them and uh to her but now he's passed away so uh she's you know just a lot of burdens there but yeah remember your sister too someone else anyone yeah robin
Okay. All right. Anyone else? Steve? Yeah. That's right. <laughs> All right. Do you remember Jim? Yeah. All right. Remember them. Um, also, Steve Paulus. Steve's been sick for a while, and they don't know what's wrong with him. They can't find anything, but he's losing a lot of weight. And uh, he just doesn't feel good. And he told me Sunday, he said, I just don't feel like being here. He said, but I, I, he wanted to come because Greg was speaking. And that's, of course, this is his son. And he said, I wanted to come. And I know she wanted to come. So he, he's going to go back to the doctor one more time and then maybe uh, try to find a, a new set of eyes to look at him, perhaps, somewhere. So uh, he's just really struggling. So keep Steve in your prayers. And not just, you know, we mentioned Holly, but not just Holly, but David and the kids. You know, this is an extended sickness. And, and I know she's, the, the church has been a blessing to them. And uh, what we were able to do there last Sunday, I believe it was. Am I right? Uh, or was it the Sunday before? Yeah, okay. Um, that was a big blessing to them. Appreciate you, all of you on that and uh, what people have done even since then. So I uh, do appreciate it. Anybody else before we pray? Yeah, Kelly. Yeah. Yeah, that's his livelihood. Pray about that. How's Amanda's stomach? Okay. No, I'll leave that to the doctor. Let him take care of that one. Yeah. Yeah. 
Well, remember Sunday from 2 to 4, we'll have a reception here at the church for Clyde and Amy, where they got married. If you weren't here Sunday morning, we announced that. You may not know about it. Probably all of you do. So uh, if you can make it to that, that'd be great. Uh, it's from 2 to 4. Well, yeah. Yeah, that's right. Remember Larry. Larry's recovering, doing well. I think uh, Steve ran into him Sunday uh, before you ran into him Sunday. When Steve ran into him, Larry was up exercising and walking. When you ran into him, he'd already found the cart. And so, but he's, he's making, yeah. So he's making some progress. And uh, so do remember him. Yes. Laurel, okay, all right, anyone else, okay, Brother Mark, would I put you on the spot if I ask you to open us in prayer tonight, thank you brother. Well, you know, let's think about ourselves for a second in the many different roles that we serve and have served in the past. For example, uh, basically as a Christian. Now think about ways that you may have failed in your life as a Christian, okay? And then what about as a parent? Is, have you failed as a parent? And if you think of other ways, how about as an employee? Have you ever failed as an employee? Or maybe you've been in a position to where you've been an employer and you've employed others. Have you ever failed as a supervisor or a boss? Have you ever failed as a husband or as a wife? Okay. So when I mention these categories tonight as failures, what about a friend? Have you ever failed as a friend to someone else? When we will listen to these, these uh, areas of, of possible service and positions that we've held, how many of you had something come to mind when I would mention one of those areas, a way that you have failed? Anybody? Everybody. Everybody, absolutely. And I may share with you an instance tonight of when I failed. It was earlier in my ministry, and, and as I've never forgotten it. But I'll, I, may say, I may share that with you here in just a little while. But we all have times in our life when we feel like failures, and often when we do fail, we feel somewhat overwhelmed because sometimes we may feel... What, what are some feelings we can have when we fail? What are some feelings you've experienced when you have failed? Guilt. 
Okay, what else? Shame. All right. Anger. Mad at yourself, maybe. What about embarrassment? Okay, embarrassment. You ever felt it to where you just, every time you think about it, even today, you feel yourself getting hot and red uh, because you're embarrassed over something that maybe happened years ago? Um, anything else? How you feel when you fail? Anger, mad, guilt, uh, embarrassment? Discouraged, okay. So we're, we're right on the borderline of also then talking about how does failure impact us? How does it change us? How can, how can failing impact us? Not just how we feel, but what can it cause in our life? How can it impact us? I'm sorry? Depends on... Okay. Charles Swindoll once said that life is 10% of what happens to you, and it's 90% of how you respond to it, okay? So <clears throat> if that is true, and I believe it is true, he's talking about attitude, it is true, it, will, it depends on how it impacts you, it's all depending on how you respond to the failure. But uh, any other examples of how it could impact you, how failure could impact you? Not just about how it makes you feel, but what it can cause, it can hurt you. That's a big failure, isn't it? Yeah. Well, did you at any time, when you failed to see that pole, and you walked right into it, you rode into it, did at any time, did you say to yourself, stupid? See? Now, yeah. Then you're saying, ouch, this is going to hurt in a moment. Well, when I said you, you say stupid, a lot of times when we fail at something, can we be hard on ourselves? Yes, we can. And we can, we, can, we can think that we're stupid. We can think that we are inadequate. Okay? Anything else about how failure can impact you? What's that? Depression. Okay, it can make you down. You know, depression is a big thing. A lot of people scoff at depression. But depression is real. And a lot of people experience it. I, I'd only experienced it, I think, one time in my life. I had just left Kentucky. And I came back from Kentucky from pastoring. Came back in the state police. And for the first time, I had feelings of not wanting to get up and do anything. I didn't want to go anywhere. I didn't want to be involved in anything. And the pastor at that time, uh, Wayne Peters, uh, sat down. He talked to me for a long time one day about that. And uh, he talked about the changes that I had went through from leaving a full-time pastorate, leaving a church that I loved, a, fa a church that had become my family because... Me and Kim went there. We left everything we had, and that's all we had was them. And we leaned on them. And they took us in and took care of us and treated us like their own family from the very beginning. So he was talking to me about some of the things that I was experiencing that I wasn't thinking about. Depression can be a real thing. Okay? What about um, when we fail? Does it sometimes make our goals seem like they are less attainable. There you go. That's exactly what I'm talking about. Teresa, that's a good job. It's a good job. You tell Ski, Ski speaks it for you. You're the brains behind this operation. We know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so say, say, it, say it again then, Teresa, what, what you're talking about about faith. Scared to try again. So in other words, what I just said, it makes your goals seem less attainable. Why is that? Because you failed and you're afraid to try. Um, I used to listen to Charles Swindoll speak a lot. And he's up in his, uh, his late 80s now. I still listen to him from time to time, not as much as I used to. 
but he would have some great one-liners, and he was a good teacher. And Charles Swindoll uses humor a lot in his pastoring. And he said, the only real failure that you're going to experience in life is the failure to try. I never forgot that. The one failure that you experience in life is the failure to try. When you stop trying because you failed, because your goals don't seem like they're attainable, that's when it's going to get you. And so failure oftentimes distorts your perceptions of your abilities. You start to perceive yourself as incapable, not able to do anything. And once you fail, you're likely to assess your skills, you assess your intelligence, you assess your capabilities, and to say that uh, I'm, I'm, more, I'm significantly weaker than what I really am because you failed. When in reality, you're able to accomplish much more than what you feel like that you are. Oh, absolutely, Steve. Yeah. Steve, Steve is speaking of withdrawal. Does it kind of cause you to withdraw? Absolutely it can. And, you know, that leads even more to depression when you withdraw. Um, it really does. It's a lonely feeling sometimes. Um, failure can make you believe that you're helpless. In, in other words, your, your mind responds to this wound that you now have because of failure. Your mind responds to it in a way to say, don't do that again. Just give up because getting hurt hurts too bad. Many people in church have quit church because they got hurt and their mind says, that hurts too bad and I'm not going to allow myself to get close again. I'm not going to do it. In my years in the ministry, I've made some close friends. I've made some close friends, and, and I'll be honest, my, my approach to leadership is that I want to know my people. Um, like here, for example, my job limits me a lot in the time that I have. It really does, and I hate that sometimes. But I don't think God's done with me there yet either. So I have to stay, you know, and, and juggle the two. But sometimes when you want to get to know people and you want to experience things with people, from a leadership perspective, sometimes you'll keep just a little bit of what I call a professional distance. You don't allow yourself to get too close sometimes in leadership because you want to be able to always deal with a problem. And if you get too close sometimes with people and they, they have an issue or a problem, it may interfere with your ability to respond to them in the correct way. So I don't know that that's exactly right, but that's an area that I struggle with. And so when you're thinking about failure, when I've had close friends, I've allowed myself to have very close friends, sometimes I've been hurt. And some of the greatest hurts that I've ever experienced has been in the church. Two places where hurts hurt the most. And I've said it before. Do you remember where they are? At home and at church. Because that's where you care the most about. And that's where the people love you and you love them. And you don't expect them to hurt you. But sometimes if you do get hurt, you'll back away and you, your mind says, don't go there again because it's, it's going gonna, it's gonna to hurt you and it's going to hurt too bad. When actually what it does, it robs you of success. If I allow myself to just continue to keep what I call a professional distance, it's going to rob me of success that I could have in relationships with others. Okay? Because if I'm true to the Lord, we can get very close with each other and if I'm true to the Lord and true to his calling, then he, the Holy Spirit, will help me to deal with things as I need to, when I need to. He'll give me the strength and the grace to do it, and he'll work in other people's hearts as well, right? And so we trust him for that. But failure sometimes causes us to go the other way. And so, uh, you know, when we're faced with uh, uh, someone, Charles Swindoll said this as well, and uh, this I didn't know. I was researching him today, and I found something. I didn't know he ever said this. The other two I was familiar with that I told you about. 
But he says, we are all faced with a series of great opportunities. You got that part so far? We're all faced with a series of great opportunities, brilliantly disguised as impossible situations. Brilliantly disguised as impossible situations. So we often look at things as if they cannot be accomplished, but they're brilliant, they're wonderful opportunities, but they're just disguised and we think we can't achieve it. You're a rock climber, right? I'm not a rock climber, but I can imagine, as uh, you never know it by looking at me, I, I know that. Um, <clears throat> uh, however, huh? <laughs> I'm a rock, yeah, yeah, I'll fall like a rock. You know, you can't, you can't see me hanging from, from a rock, can you, with one arm and just hanging there going, take my picture. No, <laughs> it's like, hurry, take my last picture. But have you ever faced a challenge, this has kind of come to me when I was thinking about you, that you didn't, you didn't know if you could do it, but it was a, an awesome opportunity that you achieved in spite of your doubts in your mind? So it's, it's, you're talking about other people helping you to figure things out, the challenges. But you can't stop. And then once you do it, it's a big payoff, isn't it, for what you get to experience at the end of it, at the end of the climb. And in some ways, the spiritual life is a lot like that. We're climbing, and we come across things that are hard sometimes, and we help each other. And so don't allow failure to defeat you. Look at it maybe as an opportunity. An opportunity to learn because failure sometimes is life's greatest lessons. So the Bible is a series of stories about failure. Let me throw out a name to you and you tell me how they failed. Adam and Eve. Huh? <laughs> What'd you say? Yo, know, whoa. Adam and Eve, how did they fail? What did they do? They disobeyed. Right? They disobeyed. Absolutely. Yes, they did. Tried to figure things out on their own instead of just following God's direction. Okay? So that's Adam and Eve. What about, what about Noah? You remember how Noah failed? He got drunk. And so he, he built this big boat, and biggest boat ever in its day to, to this point. And God had provided for him and locked him in and protected him. And then after that, he got drunk. What about Moses? How did Moses fail? Well, yeah, he, he whacked the rock. When the Lord told him to speak to the rock, right? And he hit it and he struck it. God was gracious to him there, but he still failed. And that's an important thing to remember. God is gracious to us when we fail. We don't think so. Sometimes we picture God as... As he's, he's standing there ready to, like a whack-a-mole. And he, he, as soon as we fail, he's got the big hammer and he's going to bust us right in the head with it. But it's not like that. It's not spiritual whack-a-mole, okay? He, he's there to help us and to encourage us and to get us through it. But Noah also failed after, of course, he, or Moses, after uh, not just striking the rock, but he also killed an Egyptian. Remember that? And he killed an Egyptian. So, and he had to flee to the desert. How did, how did King David fail? Now, King David failed many times. But what's the most popular failure that we know of? Bathsheba. And so he had an affair with Bathsheba, and then he had her husband killed. And so David was a failure in the Bible. What about Peter? How did Peter fail? Remember? Oh, yeah. Lord, I'll never deny you. I will never, ever, 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 ever deny you, Peter. Before the cock crow, you'll deny me thrice. Three times. Peter denied him. What about John Mark? A little over further on in the New Testament. You remember how John Mark failed? He turned back. He left the other missionaries he was with, and he left them. 
uh, Paul had a problem with John Mark. And John had failed. John Mark had failed. But you know what did Paul later say about him? Do you remember? Yes. He, he is profitable uh, to me or profitable unto the ministry. Okay? So failure doesn't stop. Failure doesn't stop. When um, I was, and I'll try not to sell, share too many illustrations, I would started preaching when I was 15 years old. I preached my first message December the 18th of 1985. And everybody wanted me to go to Bible college. And they just knew that it was God's will for my life to be in the full-time ministry. But there was something else I wanted to be since I was a boy. I wanted to be a soldier. And I wanted to be a policeman. And that was in my heart from as long back as I can remember. And how would God join all of these? So I went in the military, got sent overseas during the first Iraq conflict. And then I came back and became a policeman. And a lot of people were disappointed in me because I didn't go to Bible college. I later attended Bible college, later took online courses and did what I could over the years to increase my knowledge. But many people perceived me as a failure. So I remember there were several years that went by, and I didn't step in a pulpit. I never preached a message, I never taught a lesson, and I never sang a song. And so I went to a Bible college one day in Raleigh, North Carolina, the Southeastern Free Will Baptist Bible College, some of my friends were there, and we was out by a pond one night, sitting and talking. And one of my good friends, who was a student there at the college, looked at me, and he said, you remember Jonah? And I said, yeah. He said, don't ever forget that God is a God of second chances. He's not waiting to whack you, Jimmy. He's waiting to use you. He's just waiting. So, the rest was history. We all fail. If you would have asked me back then what I've ever pastored, this being the third pastor, I would have told you absolutely not, never. But God uses you, and God is gracious to us. And so let's talk about that. Let's talk about how that he is. So when we look at the results of failure, okay, and we've talked about a few things, we want to remember that failure reminds us that we are human. So if we're going to deal with failure, let's remember we are a human being. This is not a cop-out, if I can use that term. If I can, I can definitely use it, the word cop, okay? And uh, by the way, you all know how the word cop came around? You do. We call them coppers. And the reason they called them coppers was the badges were made of copper. So they called them coppers. And then it became short later on for cop. And that's what they call it. So if you look at the history of it, it's not a slang term in a sense that's negative. That's why they do that. So what I'm telling you tonight is not a cop out. It's not an excuse to say, oh, well, we're only human. Yes, we're not talking about using that as an excuse, but to look at it for the reality that it is. Do you know that God is fully aware that we are human beings? Did you know that, right? Because in Psalms chapter 103, verse number 14, the psalmist says this, For he knows, that is God, for he knows our frame. Okay? He remembers that we are dust. He knows that. God knows what he's dealing with. He knows that we're human. He knows that we are made of dust. David described God in this psalm, in this section of the psalm of 103, as a compassionate father who knows his children. He understands their weaknesses. He is ever tender. He is always loving. He is caring toward all 
who genuinely love him and reverence him. A failure is not going to stop you from God using you. What's that? Oh, it's 103 verse 14, but it's actually a few verses up before 14 for the context of it. Psalms 103 verse 14, but if you look in verse 13, for example, it's going to say, as a father, he's talking about God, as a father pities his children, so the Lord pities those who fear him. Now if you put it together, as a father pities his children, so the Lord pities those who fears him, for he knows our frame and he remembers that we are dust. That's God. And so don't allow your failure to just destroy you because as our creator, God knows our exact nature. He understands that we are just mere dust. And failure reminds us... I'm sorry? Did someone say something? Okay. Failure reminds us that God, all, what God already knows, that we are human, we make mistakes, and we all fail, and sometimes we fail miserably. But we don't want that to defeat us because when we get to the point of what we talked about earlier, when we think we can't, we won't. When we think we can't, we won't. And when we forget the fact that we are human beings and we are subject to failure and we are subject to sin and we are subject to falling short of God's glory, and that's every single one of us, when we get to that point, don't let it defeat you. Understand it. And embrace it and say, God, thank you for loving me because I'm dust. I'm not much. Humility is a big thing. Humility is a big thing with failure because failure keeps us humble. So the first thing about this results of failure is it reminds us we're human, but the second thing is, is that it keeps us humble. <clears throat> okay? Feeling like a failure is sometimes the best thing that can happen to us. I'm going to say that again. Feeling like a failure is sometimes the best thing that can ever happen to us. Why would that be? It humbles you. And what happens when it humbles you? What do you recognize? What do you realize? Your need. We realize how desperately we need the Lord. I mentioned Brother Wayne Peters. He called me the other day, wanted me to sing in a funeral. Every time I get asked to sing in a funeral, I get sick. I don't know why that is. But he asked me to sing in a funeral on Friday for a lady that we had both known. And we were talking about this, and he didn't know about the lesson. And he says, sometimes, Jimmy, the best thing that can happen in life is failure. Because God has a way of when you are starting to feel confident and starting to feel sure of your abilities, he has a way of allowing something to happen that makes us realize how much we need him and how little we actually are on our own. And so that's exactly what we're talking about tonight is feeling like a failure is sometimes the best thing because if we always feel successful, we're just going to become prideful, aren't we? We're going to become very prideful. That's the last thing you want. So you want to know how much you need God. Uh, remember the, the story in the Bible of Luke chapter 18 when the Pharisee and the publican were praying? Remember? Now, I made a mistake once. I was preaching from this passage. And I was talking about the Pharisee, and I misspoke. I really did. And I said the prayer between the Pharisee and the Republican. I didn't catch it immediately. It's the Pharisee and the publican. Okay? But I did make a mistake. It was a failure. Okay? But it's okay. I'm sure there were some Democrats in there that was hot with me when I said it, but it wasn't intentional. I'm glad God was more gracious than than they were, right? Actually, they laughed about it. Everybody found it humorous. They know I didn't mean it. But what happened in this story? You have the Pharisee and you have the tax collector. Both are praying in the temple. The Pharisee thinks that he is just it. 
He is an all-around success, keeper of the rules and the law, the most righteous person to ever walk on the face of the earth. And so he prays and he thanks God that he is so good and that he's not like everybody else. He's not like those robbers or those evil doers or those adulterers over there. I'm not like this dishonest tax collector over here, this publican. I'm not like him. Thank you, God, that I'm not like him. And then the Pharisee also says in verse 12 of chapter 18, he says, I fast twice a week, and I give tithes of all that I provide, or all that I'm provided. I give tithes. I fast twice a week. I'm this, I'm that. Matter of fact, he come to church so that others could and probably just receive the blessing of hearing a man like that pray. Because he was really all of that. At least he thought. But success can make us think that we should be honored. But it's not us that needs to be honored. It's God that needs to be honored. So the tax collector, he's considered a traitor to his people. He failed his family, failed his country, failed God, and so he won't even come into the church building. The publican stands out in the hallway or in the vestibule, and he says, I'm not worthy to come in there. So he prays, Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. Have mercy on me, a sinner. And then Jesus responds to this failure. I tell you, in verse 14, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. He was justified rather than the other. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. Failure sometimes makes us humble, and it reminds us of how much we need God. Few things can humble us like failure. And the Pharisee would have been a much better person if he would not have felt so much like a success. Early in the ministry, I was in my early 20s. I was a youth pastor, and there was a group coming to visit our church from a Bible college. And I was told, here, you take it and run it plan everything, put it all together. And I said, well, we've got to feed them. I told the pastor, we, we have to be able to feed them and we want to be able to give them some money to, to leave on to help them with their expenses. He said, well, do you want me to help you with it? And I said, no, I'm fine. He said, well, here's some money that you can, you know, from the church that you can buy them some pizzas and stuff and feed them that night and then just give them you know, whatever's left over. I was so full of myself because I was in charge and I was putting all of this together that I went and bought them all pizza and I was proud of the fact that I did all of this and I'm putting it all together for them. They're going to think a whole lot of me. Boy, that Jim Mitchell, he's got it together. He knows what he's doing. And so when I bought them all the pizza, I had $12 left over. I didn't think about the cost of it. Sometimes we don't always count the cost. But I didn't think about the cost of it, and all I had left to give was $12. And I was so embarrassed because I was so full of myself, I didn't think to think through the details. And uh, I remember their face when I gave them $12, and I said, but we're going to get you some more, and I'm going to send it to you. And we did that, and we took care of that. Had I had to do over, I would have never given them the $12. I'd have just told them that we're going to have to send you a check. And I apologize for the inconvenience, but we're going to have to send you a check. It was just something little that I've never forgot. And time and time again, it'll come back to my memory. And I'm thinking, how could I be so, what is it, Gene? Stupid. How could I have been so stupid not to see it right in front of me because I was too involved with myself? So failure makes us humble. Failure draws us closer to God. Some of the greatest failures in the Bible happened after long periods of success. Noah was drunk after successfully building the ship. David was a successful ruler, had increased Israel's territory over 100%, but yet 
He couldn't, he could handle all the enemies that God sent their way and that the enemy came to confront them, but he couldn't handle a woman bathing on the other roof because he was prepared for that, but he wasn't prepared for what was now in front of him. It showed the condition of his heart at that time. But yet God said of this failure, David, that he was a man after his own heart because God looked past sometimes the failures to see the potential. And God knows what he's going to do and God knows what he wants to do in your life. It's time to forget the failures. Forget them. God said he cast them as far as the east is from the west. There's a reason for that. The north and the south will eventually meet. The east and west are gone forever and ever and ever. Never to be remembered again. Forget them. Forget them in the sense that you're not going to let them drag you down, but you remember them in the sense of how gracious God is to you in spite of it. So it draws you closer to God. Long periods of success sometimes causes us to become prideful when, and then it pushes God out of our life. I remember I'd been a police officer for 10 years and uh, I joined the state police at that time. I remember going back through that academy again for 25 weeks. It was a long time. And I remember when we got to the end of it, there was a lot of young men in there, 21, 22 years old, and they finally got to put on that green uniform for the first time, completely, on graduation day. Everything but the badge. They couldn't wear the badge. That comes after graduation, and you pick who you want to put that on. My dad put mine on. But I remember watching those young men so full of themselves, walking with their hands out here as if they actually had that big muscles. But they didn't. But they walked like this, and they had their hat pulled down so low, and they strutted like a rooster across the compound. I remember watching that, and I'm thinking, God help them. Because to whom he gives much power, and to whom he gives great power, he expects them to do great things with it. It is a position of service and of helping people, not of going out and being prideful. But I remember that. But before I be too hard on them, I also remember being that young and being a police officer and being that young. I remember strutting. I remember getting out in Beckley City Police and I worked for them. It was in the wintertime, made a traffic stop, pulled my hat down low, adjusted my gun belt. I had a V back then, not a pair. It was a V. Now, I look good. And I remember getting out and adjusting everything and walking up to that car. And I hit a patch of ice. Just like that, I was under the car. <laughs> the guy comes back to help me. He hit his black eyes, hit as slick as it can be. We're both trying to dance on that ice to try to get him, try to get me out from under the car. It's like Winnie the Pooh stuck in the hole, you know. So he helps me out, and we get up, and he says, now, sir, he said, I, I apologize. Why did you stop me? I said, it's not even important anymore. <laughs> I said, you go on and have a good night. Talking about some humble pie. I wasn't strutting as near as much as I was going back to my car as I did going up there. Did I tell that story? Yeah. I've never forgot it. Never forgot it. There's another time I made a traffic stop and walked up to the car and I see a driver's license, registration, insurance. He says, sir, I need, I said, no. give me your driver's license, registration, insurance. But sir, I said, sir, you just give me the information. He said, but your light bar's on fire. <laughs> and I look back and sure enough it was. And I, I said, stand by. We're both back there putting out the 
putting out the fire, you know. Same thing. Sir, what, what did you need to, what did you stop me for? I said, I don't even remember. It, it doesn't matter. Failure in life reminds you of who you are. Embrace it. Embrace it. I thank God for those lessons in life that I've never, ever forgot. Never. So failure will draw you closer to God. So we know this, so how do we recover from it? Let's, let's close this out. Let's talk about how do we recover from failure. Well, we have to do four things. First of all, you've got to admit it. It's that simple. You've got to admit that you failed. A lot of people don't want to do that. They don't want to admit that they failed. When we fail, we have two choices. We can either confess it or we can cover it up. That's the two choices we have. Confess it, cover it up. One pastor told me that I worked under one time. He said, if you're right, he said, you stand on it. And you don't move one inch if you're right. If you're wrong, you'd be the very first person to apologize for it. Pretty good advice. But when we think about admitting the failure, Proverbs 28, 13. He who covers his sins will not what? Do you remember that passage? He who covers his sins will not prosper. But whoever confesses and forsakes them will have mercy. So if confession <clears throat> is coming into agreement with God that we are indeed wrong, then admitting that we are wrong is often difficult because it acknowledges failure. But confession is impossible without admitting our failure. You can't confess until you first of all acknowledge that you're wrong. And then confession comes in. So I don't know where we get the idea that we have to be perfect because none of us are perfect. We're not even close to perfect. I get the most positive comments about a sermon at times when I feel like that I'm the biggest failure. That makes sense to you? Sometimes when I feel like that I am the biggest failure and I have, I have struggled all the way through a message, it's oftentimes when God is doing his greatest work because I'm leaning so much upon him. There's been times in this church that I have preached a message and I have gotten halfway through it and I just wanted to sit down. I have felt that way personally. So distracted at some points that my mind, the devil is just saying, just quit, just stop. This is such a flop. Just quit it. Just go ahead and close it in prayer and sit down. I feel that way sometimes. But you depend on the Lord. It's sometimes a spiritual struggle that takes place right there in that pulpit. And you trust God and he always delivers. And the times when you think was the worst is when you depend the most upon God. So admit the failure. Trust in the Lord. Recover from it requires that we admit the failure, both to God and to anyone else that we've hurt. We have to admit it. The second thing we do to recover from failure is accept God's forgiveness. Let's go back to Psalms for a second. Again, 103. We looked at verse 13. We looked at verse 14. Now let's look at verse 10 for a second. It says that he, meaning God, has not dealt with us according to our sins. You catch that? Some people feel like that when they sin, God's waiting. He's just waiting, like we said about whack-a-mole. He's just sitting there waiting. But the scripture says he has not dealt with us according to our sins, nor punished us according to our iniquities. This means that God doesn't deal with us on the basis of our failures. But he deals with us on the basis of his grace. Romans 5 says, shall we continue in sin now that grace may abound? Well, Romans 6, God forbid, he says. 
if you go back to Romans 5, they were talking about, well, since every time we sin, that grace abounds, and if we sin this much and grace superabounds, then why don't we just keep on sinning? Because if grace is that good and grace keeps superabounds, why don't we just keep on sinning? Paul saw that, and he addressed it in the next chapter, and he says, what? What? Shall we continue in sin now that grace abounds? God forbid. How shall we continue in sin when we're supposed to be dead into sin? So we admit it. We accept God's forgiveness because he's not dealing with us according to our sins. He's not dealing with us according to our iniquities. And the word grace means a favor or a kindness shown without regard to worth or merit. Grace, there's an acrostic for it. God's reward at Christ's expense. You probably all heard that. God's reward at Christ's expense. That's an acrostic for grace, and that's what God does. So another thing, how we respond to failure and how we recover from it is to apply the lessons of failure. An example is given of Babe Ruth. Babe Ruth set a home run record of 60 home runs in 1927. He held the record of 714 career home runs, a record that stood for almost 50 years until Hank Aaron broke it in 1974. You know something else that's interesting about Babe Ruth? He also led in the number of strikeouts. Nobody talks about that. The only real failure is the failure to try. Babe Ruth accomplished a record that held from 1927 to 1950 because he tried. Every time he struck out, he knew he'd come back up to bat. Forget the strikeout. This one's going to be a home run. And if he struck out, the next one was going to be a home run. He just didn't quit trying. You can't quit trying. You fail, you get up. When I was young, we had a little pony. We called her Sugar. We called her Sugar because she loved sugar. We'd ride her bareback every morning. We had a big field in front of the house and had a big valley in it. And we'd whistle for Sugar, me and Donnie, before we go to school. Sugar would come over there and we'd give her a little treat. We'd jump on her back, grab a hold of her mane. Nudge her in the side and say, come on, sugar. And boy, she'd run. And there she'd go. She'd go all the way down that long driveway through the valley up the other side of the hill around the trail back up in front of the barn, come back around a circle and stop right there at the gate again at the house. And we'd jump off of her, give her a little sugar. Not a smooch, but sugar, little clumps of sugar. And then we'd go on to school. We'd walk down and catch a bus. But it was an interesting time because one morning when I first started riding sugar, I fell off sugar. And my dad was there and he said, what are you going to do now, boy? And I said, I don't know. He said, you're going to get back on. Get back on. Ride it again. And we did. And that's how you mastered it. I was eight years old. Dad put me on his tractor. He said, all right, son, you take it down the hill there. Now you stomp at the top of the hill, and I'll get the gate. Don't hit the brakes. i got time to get the gate. Put it in first low. Let the motor hold it back. Don't hit the brakes now, and I'll go get the gate. I'll have it open for you by the time you get there. So I get to the top of the hill, start heading down. Dad just now fooling with the chain. I'm thinking, Dad ain't going to get the gate open in time. So I hit the brakes. When I hit the brakes on the steep hill, locked them up, tractor started sliding. Went right through the gate. I got to the bottom, the gate's off the hinges. Dad looks at me and he said, hit the brakes, didn't you? And I said, yes, sir. He said, now you'll listen to me next time. You know how many times I still have that old tractor? I still have it. You know how many times I remember that? About every time I get on the tractor. 
Now, don't hit the brakes going down the hill. You're going to slide. Lock it up. There's a left and a right brake. He taught me how to do that. Failure sometimes gets us right back in line where we need to be. Don't believe the lies of the devil, guys. Don't give up because you fail. Trust him. Just acknowledge it. Go on. Acknowledge that it's not final. Matthew 26, 34. Peter had denied Jesus. He'd walked away from him. Peter arrogantly tells Jesus that he'll never desert him, and he did. And Jesus told him, he said, Assuredly, I say to you this night before the rooster crows, you're going to deny me three times. And he did. But later on in the scripture, in John 21, Peter's after Peter's denial, he and some of the disciples are fishing on the sea. It appears that Peter's gone back to his old occupation of fishing. They fished all night and they haven't got anything. And Jesus yells out, I used to preach a message on this passage a lot when I was doing revivals. I will if you will. He said, you catch anything, guys? He said, no. He said, cast your net on the other side. What? What are you talking about, Cat? We fished all night. We're tired. Cast your net on the other side. But we've been out here all night. It's been nothing but a failure. Cast your net on the other side. If you'll do what I tell you, I'll bless you. But they couldn't get past the fact that they hadn't caught anything. So they caught the fish, right? It was a large number of fish. And they rushed to the shore after that, and they was having dinner with Jesus. And at this fire and at this dinner, Jesus asked Peter three times if he loved him. Peter says, yes, Lord, you know I love you. Peter, do you love me? Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And then finally the third time, he says, Lord, you know all things. You know all things, so you know that I love you. Do you think that Jesus ever thought when Peter was denying him that he didn't love him? No. Because Jesus knows all things. In the time of Peter's failure, Jesus knew that Peter loved him. But Peter needed a failure to have a success. Next time you see Peter, he's preaching with power. And 3,000 people are saved. Yea, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. And then we're reminded in Samuel, one of my favorite verses. For the Lord does not see as man sees. For man looks on the outward appearance. But God looks on the heart. Let me close with this. I'm glad that I don't judge people. I'm glad I'm not the final say on a person's life. Because if I were, I would get it wrong on many occasions. God knows the heart of a person. We may look at a failure, and we might make a judgment about that person's spiritual condition because of a failure. But God knows their heart. He knows what's on the inside. Failure's a big deal. But it doesn't have to rule our life. We acknowledge it and we deal with it. We embrace it. And thank you, Lord, for the opportunities that have been masqueraded brilliantly as impossible task, but as possible. Any comments? We're five minutes over. Um, we try to honor Wednesday nights as close as we can to time. Well, let's pray together. Yes, Key? Uh, yeah.
That's his mother-in-law. Stuber. All right. Well, let's go to prayer. And in our dismissal tonight, we'll pray for Joyce as well. Okay? All right. Heavenly Father, we do thank you for this evening. Thank you for your presence that we felt here tonight. Lord, thank you for failure. Thank you for your grace. Thank you for to, to know that you love us like you do. And Lord, we just thank you and hope we can apply the truths we've learned tonight to our hearts. And Lord, we remember when I asked for help for Joyce, Lord, for Tony's mother-in-law. God, you've heard the situation. You know the dire need that she is in. And Father, we know that you are God. And you are able to do all things and nothing is without uh, hope when you are involved. And so, God, we pray that your divine will is accomplished, for you know all things. You know all things. So, God, we pray for your intervention and your will to be done, that you'll be glorified in all things that take place. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. And God bless you. Have a good night. Remember, I'm not going to get around you guys tonight, so don't think I'm being rude, unless you just want me to share. <laughs>